So this system is called an aerated static pile. Aerated means that we're pushing air through it. Static means that it, we don't move it. A lot of compost you turn. This we build and it sits there for one month. And then it's pile because it's a pile. <laughs> so that's the name of this technical system. Uh, the ingredients for any kind of compost are the same. And those are something high in nitrogen, which in this case we use food waste something high in carbon. For us, that's wood chips, wood waste. It could be dried leaves, it could be straw. Um, anything that's turning brown from nature is usually high in carbon. Um, and then the two more invisible ingredients of air and water. And so getting these things in the correct ratio is what allows an optimal decomposition pro process, right? Everything is going to decay one way or another we're just looking at how to end up with the, the best case scenario um, because it could also decay when food waste goes to the landfill, it decays without air and without management. And often like, you know, people, um, people's kitchen garbage is in a plastic bag, right? So it doesn't get air it's, and it creates methane. So food waste in the landfills creates methane, which is a greenhouse gas that warms the, the planet more than 20 times faster than carbon dioxide. So by pulling food waste out of the landfill and managing it effectively, methane stinks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been around methane and I know we all have masks on, but does it smell here? No. Nope. You know, it's pretty like you're surrounded by <laughs> tens of thousands of pounds of food waste right now. And it's just like, meh. Like there's not a pack of raccoons hanging out. It's not stinky. We're not like, oh, you know, it smells sweet because it's effectively managed. And so we're just collaborating with that natural decomposition process. I want to show you how the aerated static piles work and how to set them up. Um, So we're using a positive airflow system to introduce oxygen into this material through a very simple system using a one horsepower blower. And this blower is currently set up to a timer which we can adjust airflow according to the needs of the material and the microbes. Um, anywhere between 15 to 30 seconds of air every half hour is, is sufficient to provide the oxygen and the air that those microbes need in order to then decompose and facilitate the composting process. Um, in this phase of composting, the material is sitting static for approximately 30 days. Uh, you'll see temperatures reaching 160 degrees in these piles. Industry standards require that compost material is heated up to 131 degrees for a minimum of three days. Uh, we, we take that a bit further to really ensure that things are remaining aerobic as long as possible. And getting those temperatures up is important to annihilate any weed seeds that may come in through your feedstock, uh, as well as pathogens. So here we're, we're dealing with uh, food waste and food scraps on, on, on this side of our composting operations. So pathogens that may come in through meat and dairy are important to, to inoculate, or not inoculate, but annihilate in this process. And we could, uh, I can kind of show you maybe step one of what this looks like because right now this material has sat for 30 days. We will then bring in our front end loader to remove this material from the static pile. It will come up to the upper deck at which point we will introduce more water into that material and continue to turn that material for another two months. Well, this sits here static, are you still watering it? Well? No, no. So initially we're watering heavily, getting that material moist to roughly a 68% moisture level. The easy 
test for that is literally a squeeze test. So you can take that material in your hands, squeeze it. If water is dripping out, you have too much moisture. Um, if, it, if it feels dry and is not sort of clumping and sticking together, you know you need to add more water. So, and also there'll be, a, there'll be a nice kind of sheen left on your hand after squeezing it. Your hand won't necessarily feel super wet, but there's a nice, you know, moisture sheen there. And the, and the material will be, you know, somewhat sticky. That's, that's the high-tech version of how to test for <laughs> moisture when content. Say, when you say food scraps, mm -hmm. what do you not put in there? There is no not. <laughs> so, so, meat, bones, Anything wants dairy. living. So meat, bone, dairy, fruits, vegetables, grains, raw, cooked. Really? Does, does not matter. Yeah. Are these pipes uh, have a holes throughout the... Correct. So yeah. the, the pipes, what you're seeing here <clears throat> is um, a, a foam core pipe. It's like a, a you know, it's a PVC based pipe and extending from these uh, from these four inch sections underneath is perforated pipe okay. so it's a four inch perforated pipe designed for leach lines uh, but works really well to push air through and the holes on those pipes are actually turned to face the ground so as the air moves through it's pushing out through the bottom of the pipe and then rising, creating a conv convective current throughout this material. Because if you were to apply this material and you had those holes facing up towards the sky, the material is going to begin to drop mm -hmm. through those holes. You're going to block that air. Mm -hmm. So you got so this big of about 30 seconds every hour. Is what you're every 30 minutes, every yeah. half hour, every half hour. Okay. And that, you know, we, we adjust a little bit seasonally, right. depending upon evaporative loss, mm -hmm. moisture coming down on top of the piles. So it's just, you know, it's a process of monitoring. Where, what are the temperatures looking like? How much evaporation is happening? And then you can adjust airflow kind of according to Bless you. the needs of, of the material and the microbes. Can I ask, what's yes. the advantage of doing this in the first month why not just turn it from the get-go well there some of the advantages you know um, space right we have limited space out here to really effectively move all this material mm -hmm. from one point to another uh, labor machinery um, you know having say if you know if you've got access to two loaders and enough labor you might just choose to do traditional windrow style composting move it flip it move it flip it so that the that traditional style of windrow composting really comes into play in sort of our second phase when that material is cooling and at that point then there's more labor involved to turn that material would that be the uh, what like a small operation like at a little garden at home that what we'd be doing like that like, yeah, like, and like, you know, and one, I mean, one of the nice advantages to this is that you're you're really ensuring high volumes of, of aerobic activity. Mm -hmm. uh, the microbial life is really going to flourish. You know, traditional windrow style turning, uh, industry standards. You're supposed to turn that material. Was it five times in the period of? Uh, well, we weekly you're supposed to turn it two to three times, essentially. And, and that turning is what is then introducing kind of that convective current in here, yeah. you know, creating that airflow so that nothing is getting too compact or, you know, going anaerobic versus aerobic. When you're putting stuff in it, where do you put it? You just throw it on top, just wherever? Or? Well, let's, let's take a walk over here and I, we can kind of go through that process. Okay. And does it attract mice and rats and... Mice, yes. Uh, mice, we do have mice out here. Rats, not so much. Just kill them and throw them in there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do compost the mice that we trap here. And... Um, oh, you do? We do. Uh, the, the mice will find their way through the perforated holes of that pipe. And... But what I've, what I've 
been seeing is that most of those mice are then nesting at the very end of the pipe in the PVC section and not affecting airflow. So they're here amongst us and we seem to live in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, but, you know, other, and, and the material that you're seeing on top of that pile right now, that is all a material that has gone through 30 days of composting. It is our cover. So it's important to cover your compost pile with, you know, mulch, tarps, or material that's already been composted. The cover layer is uh, retaining moisture, it's retaining heat, and it's also reducing vermin. Uh, whether it's ravens or coyotes, uh, it's much more challenging then for them to dig through six inches of material to potentially try to access, you know, something yummy inside. So, Trevor, do you eventually turn all of that mulch into the compost, or do you try to take it off before you turn it? No, it will. Um, it will all be incorporated into the finished product, uh -huh. and you know. From, from day one, however, clearly you're not already going to have a composted product to cover with, right? So in, in, in the first initial phase, you may just have a raw mulch uh, or a tarp or something to cover with, and then after three months, or, or, or after 30 days at least, you'll have then a product which you can cover with that, that has the right ratios of carbon to nitrogen for that finished product. So it's kind of something to keep in mind from like the, the beginning phase, you're gonna have more than likely a high carbon source that you're covering with and potentially a high carbon source on the bottom layer. And it's something to keep in mind that that particular batch may have a higher C to N ratio than future batches. Um, and in that case, if you're covering with a fresh mulch with a high carbon ratio, you may try to remove some of that material and keep it out of the, the rest of the composting process. Did I explain that? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, no? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms of our finished compost, and I know I'm just a little bit jumping the gun, but it'll, we have this giant screener, which is like a sandbox sifter. So anything that you know, small comes out one side and big comes out the other. And then that, that's how we determine what are, what are kind of our oversized that's going back into the system as a cover and, you know, gradually breaking down. So this is what's going to pull out all the plastic and stuff that'll never biodegrade? That's hand labor. Oh, really? Yeah, this does not remove, it, it does if remove plastic for the most part when, but when we get to the larger aggregate, this is all screened out from a three quarter inch screening process. So here is where we see larger bits of wood. Here is where we're gonna find those plastics. And this is, there are high tech methods out there. Um, they're extremely expensive, but you know, there are technologies that can remove that plastic fairly well. Uh, here it's literally volunteers and others is constantly yep. removing plastic. Hey, on the, uh, you mentioned the uh, pieces of wood. Does it matter well, what's the diameter of wood? The, the biggest you can put that will compost and stuff like that. Does that matter? It does. Um, so the mulch, the mulch that we use initially in the feedstock um, is, I mean, you're seeing the largest material here. Okay. Right? The finer the material, the better. The smaller the material, the better. Because then that that is going to break down faster for you. Yeah. And it's going to be less screening in the right. end. Yeah. Uh, so underneath, we have kind of varying mulches that you see here. This this is the raw raw mulch, as I call it, that uh, this is local green waste that's been ground up uh, at the Buckman Road transfer station. So this is part of what we'll use as our carbon source to integrate and complement the food waste that is currently under this mulch right now. 
and the darker mulch is essentially this is what has come out of the screening process mm -hmm. and so we're reusing this again as carbon source and that'll break down eventually into it takes a while but yeah you know it all will eventually break down and, it, and, and can you use cardboard too cardboard can be a great source of carbon preferably shredded uh, you know, you, you got to think about surface area in relation to what you're composting. What, you know, is it is it able to get wet? Are the microbes able to access that? So the smaller the surface area, always the better. That's not to say that you can't just throw in a cardboard box, right? Because it will eventually break down and provide carbon. And here, yeah, you know, so we have we have our fire hose. And that hose then is what will be utilized to water this material. Uh, our front end loader will be doing the turning. And typically, you know, two rounds of watering, two rounds of turning that material to bring it up to, to moisture. And I wish I had a pipe set up here, but you know, this would be row one of this new system. Uh -huh. There'll be a perforated pipe running from that manifold 40 feet in length behind me here and when that perforated pipe gets placed down then over top of the perforated pipe we we throw a mulch layer over top of that pipe uh, it's called a plenum layer fancy name um, that layer of mulch over the perforated pipe is allowing for air distribution even air distribution before it rises up to meet the wet, wetter, denser raw material for composting. Would a uh, like window screen work just as good as if you don't have like over the pipe? A know? window screen? Yeah. Huh. I imagine that I had not thought about that. Um, that accomplish the same, right? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, the long term piece on that. You know, as you're coming in with that loader or tractor, you got to remember, okay, I've got to take that window screen out of there, you know, without damaging it, hopefully. I mean, the same is true of the perforated pipe. So as we're coming in with that front end loader, mm -hmm. perforated pipe is here, we've got to be sure that we're not lifting it yet. Not, yeah, so not puncturing can, that, you can lifting bury that. The on it yeah. And that, that mulch layer in the bottom, again, it's ideal then to use something that's already gone through the composting process. You know, initially you might just, you'll have access to like a fresh mulch, higher in carbon, carbon and nitrogen. Um, once you get to a place where you have some composted material, better to use that on the bottom. It, and then it's just getting mixed into the whole matrix from there. Uh, and we're, we're doing, like with our food waste composting, it's one part food scraps to roughly two and a half parts brown carbon mulch. Is that in the notes? And no manure. Yep. Yeah, your notes are so exhaustive. There yeah. are so many details in that okay, book. <laughs> yeah. so that'd be Don't worry. Like a small uh, operation too. Like yeah, the and the same holds okay. true for smaller scale operations. You know, it's. And part of it, 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 it's experimentation right. with what your feedstock is. And over time, you'll, you'll kind of redefine what's optimal for you and the end use of that compost product. So it can be, you know, a one to two and a half, a one to two, a one to three. So there's variations that will all work well depending upon the end, end game. So, to speak. so so when you say the end game you're making different I thought it was all for planting soil kind of, right? It is. Or, yeah. 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 So, you know the other we have a, a manure and green waste composting that's happening just to the north of us here. And we have those two different feedstocks separated to produce slightly different uh, <laughs> composts in the end. You know, so there's variances between pH, some variances on nitrogen, phosphorus you know the macro micronutrients and the difference is for depending on what you plant and stuff or, it's yeah. yeah and well while both are are great soil amendments regardless uh, there are folks who are really keen and you know they have specific needs for what they're growing or what their their project might be in general uh, you know most folks are just kind of looking at oh does it have some nitrogen 
nitrogen, what's the pH, what's the carbon to nitrogen ratio. But there are others who you yeah, know, may be looking at it <laughs> more detail, in detail, yeah. saying, oh, well, this has a slightly higher phosphorus level. I'd like that one. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's totally fine to not even be there and know what, like, yeah. it's a, you know, if you're making compost, if you're getting rid of your food waste and adding it to your garden, like, it's, there's a whole scale, right, where it's one of those, like, minute to learn, lifetime to master kind yeah. of things, yeah. Yeah. where it's like, yep, you can get started, you you know, you can really improve your soil in a, in a great way, and then over time, you know, that these, these more kind of details and, and layers... Uh, might come in where you're like, oh yeah, this for my chili, and I want this for my flowers or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. One of the just in general, one of the major benefits, regardless of what you're composting, is is the microbiology. Right? You're really boosting the microbiology levels. You can you can take manure and let it quote unquote compost sit out and age, but you're not going to have as much benefit. Yeah, you want to take a look? Yeah, so, if you don't mind. This is, this is a three foot. Um, you know, you can get them longer. Um, but it's ideal, you know, and again, depends on the volume of material you're right. working with. But ideal to at least have this length. Where do you get those at? Uh, these you can order online. Um, Amazon. Yeah, I, I, did, I did get this from Amazon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What um, else? Is there anything else? So it's at 136 right now, so we know we're meeting the industry standards. This has been at uh, over 130. When did we put this on? This is about five five days old. This this end wow. of the system. This last row of 50 cubic yards. And and the bones will, will, will deteriorate? Eventually. If the dogs don't find them first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they deteriorate in a and different way. And bring it way. to my pillow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So are these the food scraps that you all like pick up from the area? Mm -hmm. Correct. Cool. Yep, yeah, from different schools and restaurants. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I love that you do Combination that. of the commercial service for schools and restaurants and other businesses, as well as our residential collection. Awesome. Uh, and a residential drop-off. Cool. Uh, to a certain degree, we're, we're, we've got a little bit of room if we wanted to scale up a system, uh, but there, there is a max point at which you know, a one horsepower blower is effective to aerate. Yeah. Uh, so, so once you say once it is done here, then you take it where, right there? And then, yeah, actually right behind us. And so that, that material all came off of this system okay. uh, a few days ago. So we'll bring more moisture into that, get the fire hose out, turn it, turn it, turn it, and <clears throat> approximately two months then before it can go through the screening process. And then the so three process. months in total before you so when you screen it, then that the the dirt underneath the dust will come open. You ready? Yeah. Uh, I think I'm understanding the question. So you know, once it goes through that screening process, the fine material, yeah. like we're using a 3 8 inch screen okay. to produce our finished compost, ready to put in your garden okay. or on your farm. And, okay. and then the scraps you're bringing back over here again, where they're just the screen. Right. So we, we actually do a double screening process. The first generates the finer compost. The second is a three quarter inch screen that produces a composted mulch. It's a great ground cover, uh, water retention, soil erosion control, weed suppression. So we're generating two different product lines using that screener based on the size of the mulch. So this is and then, covered then. And then the largest aggregate will come back in and essentially get recycled through the process. Okay. So it's not the dirt then, it's like covering it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on a home scale, it's kind of up to you, you know, if you want to screen it or if you're okay with some bigger chunks going into your garden. Yeah. Some people will take a piece of hardware cloth from, you know, from the hardware store. You can get half inch, three quarter inch, whatever, and frame it out with two by fours to put over their wheelbarrow to make a finer product and a thicker product. Lots of people just 
just don't mind if there are some big, you know, those will eventually, those are just adding carbon to your soil mix too, if those bigger chunks are in, so it's more of an aesthetic um, and, and preference if you're on a smaller scale. Um,